There's this very famous theorem in math, that there is no general formula for solving a polynomial of degree 5 or higher. More precisely, no formula that uses a finite amount of these five basic operations. The proof of this is very elegant and reveals an interesting connection between polynomials and the study of groups. Formally, a group is a set with one operation. This operation is closed under the group, associative, for every element there is an inverse and there is a neutral element. For the purposes of this video, you can just think of a group as a set of permutations. The so-called symmetric group, Sn, contains all possible permutations of n objects. You can swap two of them, for example, or you can shuffle them around however you like. Each of these actions, where you change or don't change the order of the objects, is one of the permutation. So think about it. What's the total number of permutations on n objects? There's n possibilities to put the first element, n minus 1 for the second, and so on up to only 1 for the last one. So there's n factorial permutations in total. Let's take a look at this polynomial. Quick spoiler, it has four roots. The values of the roots are irrational, which means we can't express them using rational numbers and the four basic operations. The field of rational numbers contains all such numbers. Numbers, which can be expressed as a sum, difference, product or division of two other rational numbers. We now allow ourselves to extend a field with an nth root of some value that's already in the field extending the rational numbers with the square root of 2 gives us a new field that not only contains all rational numbers and the square root of 2, 3 plus the square root of 2, 3 minus the square root of 2, and other values like 7 times the square root of 2, or the square root of 2 divided by 1 plus the square root of 2. Now, because the number 3 plus the square root of 2 is now in the field, we can extend it one step further with the square root of 3 plus the square root of 2. Similarly, this field contains 3 minus the square root of 2. Extending it with the square root of 3 minus the square root of 2 gives a field with all four roots of our polynomial. Let's take a look at another example. This polynomial has three roots. One of them is x1. Now think about it yourself. Can you find a chain of field extensions that ultimately contains this value? First, extend the rational numbers with the square root of 3. This field contains both 2 plus the square root of 3 and 2 minus the square root of 3. In the next two steps, adjoin the cube roots of these two expressions and you get a field containing x1. Now here's the thing. We might know all the roots of our polynomial, but we don't know their order. Take the quadratic polynomial x squared minus 2 for example. We know its roots are square root of 2 and negative square root of 2. We can call them x1 and x2, but we could as well just swap the values around and nothing changes. In fact, all equations with just rational coefficients hold true, even if you swap all instances of the square root of 2 and negative square root of 2. To get equations where you can't just swap around the square root of 2 and negative square root of 2, you have to include the square root of 2 to your set of allowed coefficients. So, let's write down the field which contains all coefficients of the equations. In the first case, we only used rational numbers, so the field of the coefficients is q. In the second case, however, we used an irrational coefficient, the square root of 2. Getting to a field that includes the square root of 2 from the rational numbers is only one field extension. Now, for each field of coefficients, there are some permutations of the values that keep the equations intact. These permutations form a group, the so-called Galois group of the polynomial over this field. In the first case, for q, all two possible permutations of the two values leave the equations intact. So the Galois group of x squared minus 2 over the field q contains all permutations of two elements, i.e. is the symmetric group S2. In the second case, however, only the do-nothing permutation, the identity, leaves our equations intact. So the Galois group over the field q adjoins square root of 2 is the so-called trivial group consisting only of the identity. Furthermore, this field, q adjoins square root of 2, contains all roots of the polynomial. This is called the splitting field of the polynomial, because you can split the polynomial using values of this field. So, we found a chain of subgroups, the Galois group of the polynomial over q to the trivial group, and a chain of fields from q to the splitting field. 
The thing is, such a chain exists if and only if the polynomial is solvable using radicals. All polynomials of a degree smaller than 5 are solvable using radicals, and therefore there exists a quadratic, cubic and quartic formula. But with degree 5 or higher, such chains don't exist for all polynomials anymore. Some of the solutions simply cannot be expressed using a finite amount of nth roots. Why? Because there is this correspondence between subgroups and field extensions, which poses a very strict restriction on which subgroups are allowed. But first, let's look at a real example. To fully understand this, maybe try finding the chain of subgroups and field extensions yourself, or just pause after each step and try to understand what we've done and why. Let's get back to our original polynomial. First, we want to find the Galois group of this polynomial over the rational numbers. Some equations with rational coefficients are true no matter how you shuffle the axis. But there's one more. The equation x1 times x3 plus x2 times x4 equals 0 only allows a handful of permutations. Obviously, we can do nothing. We can swap x1 and x3. We can swap x2 and x4. And we can swap both entire terms of the sum swapping x1 with x2 and x3 with x4. All combinations of these are of course allowed as well. We can give these permutations a name and arrange them in a group table. This is essentially the same thing as a multiplication table, but for groups. Each entry is what you get when first applying the permutation on top of the column and then the one on the left of the row. You can see that this forms a group, because every element in the table is also an element from our original set of permutations. The group is closed. Note that we can arrange the rows and columns however we like. There is no order of the group elements. Remember our strategy. To get to the splitting field, we first want to join the square root of 2, then the square root of 3 plus the square root of 2, and finally the square root of 3 minus the square root of 2. So, let's extend q by the square root of 2. This gives us a new equation. The permutations, which just swap x1 and x3, or x2 and x4, leave this equation intact. However, the permutation, which swaps x1 with x2 and x3 with x4, doesn't work anymore. Therefore, the new Galois group looks like this. The new group makes up exactly one fourth of the total group table. By rearranging the table, we can divide it into four tiles where two tiles are always the exact same. How many different tiles there are corresponds to the degree of the root you have taken in the field extension. In this case, we took a square root, so we got two different tiles. For a Galois group of a field extension, this has some interesting properties. Take the subgroup on the top left, our subgroup corresponding to the field extension. Applying the permutation sigma3 to it gives us the second tile. If we now call the subgroup G, we get this table. And you can see that this is just a group, and its table is symmetric. What we wrote down here is the so-called quotient group of our original group over G, because in a sense we divided them. And the existence of this quotient group, as well as its symmetry, is the key property of the subgroup G that makes it a Galois group of a field extension. The unsolvability of the quintic ultimately derives from the fact that some quintic polynomials simply don't have such a chain of subgroups for which a subgroup with a symmetric quotient exists. But for now, let's continue with our example. Joining the square root of 3 plus the square root of 2 to our field, we can make some new equations. One of them is the following. This equation now eliminates all permutations swapping x1 and x3. Looking at the quotient group, we can again see it has all properties. The final field extension, square root of 3 minus square root of 2, gives us this last equation. Now, there is no permutation which leaves all equations intact, except for the identity. The Galois group of the splitting field is the trivial group. And again the quotient satisfies the properties. Note that the quotient of a group with the trivial group is obviously the group itself. It's like dividing by 1. So, in fact, we were a bit lucky with our polynomial. Its Galois group over Q was already smaller than the full set of permutations on four elements. The Galois group of a polynomial essentially tells us how related the roots are. The smaller it is, the more equations with rational coefficients can be created. 
But in the worst case scenario, a polynomial of degree n will have a Galois group of the full set of permutations, Sn. Here are some examples for polynomials of degree 2 to 5 with a maximum Galois group. In order for there to be a general formula for the roots of a polynomial of degree n, there must be a chain of field extensions from the rational numbers to the splitting field. Each of these corresponds to a subgroup, but the quotient of a group with its subgroup must always fulfill the properties from earlier. It must exist and be symmetric. Furthermore, this general formula must work for all polynomials, so even for those with the biggest possible Galois group, Sn. There must be a general chain of subgroups from Sn to the trivial group for which the quotients fulfill our properties. For S2, this task is trivial, since the first subgroup is already the trivial group. For S3, you first take the subgroup called A3 and then the trivial group. For S4, you go to A4, then V4, and C2, and finally, the trivial group. But starting at S5, things are different. First you can get to A5, but A5 is a so-called simple group. There is no single subgroup whose quotient is a symmetric group, and therefore there is no quintic formula. Fully understanding this takes quite a bit of time. So I encourage you to think through all of this again by yourself. Think of some polynomials and find their chain of field extension and subgroups. And that wraps up this video. If you enjoyed it, consider liking and subscribing. And as always, I'd very much appreciate your feedback, so leave it in the comments. And now, you should watch this video.